It is a huge honor today to be with Don Zelazny, who's down here at the Spear Center uh, taking a CIRI course. And I, I thought that was so interesting because uh, I wanted to get him on and talk about volunteer, do good. Um, he's uh, into all that. But I think it's neat. We both graduated in 87. Uh, we're, bo uh, we're both in our 50s. And what I think is so damn cool about you is you just bought a Cirac machine, I mean, a couple of months ago. So, you know, most people that are, you know, uh, I'm 54, you said you're 56. 56 yeah. Most people at 56 would be thinking, man, if I had $150,000, I'm going to throw that in my retirement account. <laughs> and I just love the people that you says, you know what I'm going to do with 150 grand? I'm going to buy a Cirac machine and fly all the way from Michigan uh, to Scottsdale and listen to my uh, very good friend, Samir Puri, uh, teach you guys today. So what, what made you buy that decision? Because that, that's a big decision. Well, it's been, uh, you know, I heard about that for a long time and just wanted to get into the newer technology. Basically, I mean, listen to Gordon Christensen talk about that for years and years and years. And the technology stuff is fun. And and what did you think of the course at the Scottsdale Center? Or the, the Spear Center? Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's great. You know, a lot of, a lot of good hands-on stuff. And uh, um, I haven't done but 20 restorations with it. And that's what they, when they said to take this second course. So get in, do 20... Yeah. Get the uh, bulk learning, then come and do some fine tuning. Yeah, a lot of people think uh, Samir Puri and I are actually identical twins, and and, and we're actually not. And uh, but um, yeah, I think Samir is the uh, the best teacher in Sarac by far. My dental assistant Jan just adores him. She loves learning from him, and he's so sweet. He sometimes comes down the office and helps her with something. But um, so so um, was it because? Was it a business decision? Was it, I'm bored, boys have toys, uh, I don't want a girlfriend in a red sports car, I'm just going to get a Cerac? Was, I mean, probably, probably a little of both, I guess. Um, you know, trying to promote the one-day dentistry is, is big. And there knew some people, some patients that had said they had heard about that. And, uh, you know, the boys will have toys is another thing. I kind of like the technology aspect of it. So. Now, did you bring any um, staff with you, or are you going to scan, design, mill, stain, glaze yourself, or do you plan on having well, your your dental assistant an do that? Assistant, uh, an assistant that that's been trained in that back home that was doing a lot of that, so I can move off to another patient. It's a it's a game plan. You know, we're a little on the slow side right now. Slow side economically? No, no, no. Just just, just scanning and uh, and getting the equipment up and going. Yeah, you know, I um, I when I got mine, um, I told my four assistants, "You're gonna do this." I mean, I'm gonna. I mean, my ideal is the hygienist goes to numbs. I go there and prep. You know, Jan or Yoni or you know, they scan. They 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 do the whole thing, and then by the time they get me in for a crown seat, I just check the crown out of morbid curiosity. <laughs> Because my assistant's been with me 30 years. I mean, I, I've never, I've never tried on the crown and had to do something to it. I mean, I mean, it's you know they've been doing it forever. Yeah. So then I just see that, and um, but I know some dentists actually just totally love the scanning, the designing, the milling, the staining, the glazing. Pam does that and did all the initial training with me, so she's done. She does most of it. Yeah, and 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 two years ago, <laughs> and two years ago, you decided to add uh, the surgical placement of implants. Yes. And what 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 was Finally. that? And what was that decision based on? Well, I practiced with another dentist for quite some time. We had two practices together, and then we each uh, went our we went our separate ways. And I took a smaller practice, and he used to do a lot more of the surgery. He's a very good surgeon, and I wasn't doing a lot of the surgery at that point, which is uh, so I wanted to get into that being a solo practitioner now and uh it's also the reason i took uh, tommy murph's course tommy murph i love tommy murph he's uh <laughs> i think i think he might have you learn more in one week they're taking teeth out in guatemala than... he must have the most post on dental town or he's got to be in the top 10 i mean i think the guy is 30 all, he posted something about a snowstorm today so he, he likes to post. And that brings up uh, um, something um, controversial. You know, there's a lot of turf sharing. I know that uh, I know that on dental town, you know, oral surgeons think that only an oral surgeon should teach you extraction, and they do not 
like general dentist teaching you guys um, surgery. So then I say the oral surgeon, I, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not aware of your, your surgery course. Where do, do you go out of the country and take general dentists and teach them how to pull honey? Oh, I see. So, so you do nothing and you're mad at Tom Murphy because he does something. So Eleanor Roosevelt was right. She says, you know, uh, if you don't want to piss anybody off, if you don't want any critics, say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. I think Aristotle said it first. But it's it's just so funny how uh, that's been going around for 30 years. I mean, all the endodontists on downtown. Well, you should have referred that case. I'm sorry. Did you ever do your first root canal? Right. You know, I mean, so. And then they say, well, you know, that should be sent to specialists. Okay, well, you know, half the towns in the United States of America don't even have a specialist. You're in a town of 2,500. Right. So I'm guessing zero specialist. Well, in my little town, there's certainly plenty in the area. I mean, I'm in the suburban Detroit area, so. There's uh, there's there's plenty of specialists in the area, not just not in my little burb, but uh, within an easy driving distance. So it's not that that really drives trying to do those things. So how far are you from Detroit then? Oh, about 25 minutes. So oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you, how long were you with the partnership? You you had a partnership with two offices. Oh, 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. And would you say you amicably split or divorced? Amicably split. Yeah. Yeah. But um, a lot of these young kids in dental school, they go to dental school and they sit next to their buddy Amy for four years. They say, yeah, me and Amy, we, we decided we're, we're going to go in and, and do it together. It just sounds so fun. Right. And I would say, okay, but that's like getting married. I mean, a partnership and a marriage, I mean, there's not too many different. Take away sex and children. It's the same damn thing. Right. And 20 years is actually... One of the longer partnerships I've seen. And most. It was, and it was someone who sat next to me, basically. In dental school. Yes. In Ann Arbor. In Ann Arbor. And, and so, so going, um, you, you wouldn't haphazardly say, well, you know, we had a fun time at the movie. I think we should get married. I mean, I mean, no. I mean, usually most people date a long time and it's a very big decision. Um, what, what is your, um, what would you tell two kids sitting in fourth year dental school right now thinking, we're going to be partners um, what well, would you tell them about that decision? I don't know. We lived together, so we got to know each other pretty well. In dental school? In dental school. So nice. I lived together. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a good way to tell if you can get along. Oh, that, that's an amazing and, uh, courtship. I mean, I mean, I, I, my we mother did, would cringe well, if she heard me say this, but, for 20 years, so. but wouldn't, you, wouldn't you recommend that people live together before they got married? Um, or would I, you? Since my mother is gone, my Irish Catholic <laughs> mother, I can say yes, I would. Well, my Catholic mother is still alive, and my oldest yeah, sister is a nun, sister, and yeah, she I actually guess. listens to the show, and she may cringe. But the the point I'm just trying to make is the seriousness of that decision. Right. And is. everybody creating noise about partnership in dentistry and on Dental Town usually has an economic incentive. They they make money putting together partnerships, selling partnerships. So right. they hear all this beautiful stuff about partnership. Then it's dentists like me who hear all the 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 blue the other side of it sure. uh, the breaking up uh, and uh, so yeah so that that's a really serious um, decision and I think that I think you shacking up and living with your partner through dental school living in sin was probably was probably why you guys lasted twenty well, years I think so because would you say in your uh, in your years of dentistry that how long would you say the average partnership under ten years probably yeah. Yeah, Five years and I could give you a name of a hundred dentists who said breaking up with the dentist partner was worse than their divorce. Oh, really? Yeah. It's like wow. Yeah. I mean, that's a serious deal. So, um, so back, um, so back to Ann Arbor. By the way, your last name's uh, Polish, right? Yes, it is. And Chicago is the largest population of Polish people outside the United States. Is there a lot of Polish in Detroit too? Tons. There's a town called Hamtramck. That's full Polish. Well, he used to be, he used to have more. Now it's a real multicultural city, but it was known as one of the larger, largest cities uh, for Poles outside of Warsaw. Yeah, I think it's funny because every time I've lectured in uh, uh, Poland, I don't know, three, four times, about every five years. And if you want to go to Poland, I don't care where you live in North America, you fly to Chicago. And then they have a nonstop flight every four hours, right. just lots, just Taking flying, just shuttling back and forth to Poland. And and when you, and when you, and when you tell everybody in Poland you're from the United States, they always ask you if you know so and so in Chicago. Yeah, but uh, so um, so when they come out of dental school, 
You just bought a Cerac. You just started placing implants two years ago. They come out of dental school every year, same complaint. They didn't teach me nothing. Uh, we didn't place an implant. We didn't do Invisalign. We didn't do a Cerac. We didn't do anything. Um, if you were a kid coming out of school today, $350,000 in debt, what advice would you tell them? Well, it's, you know, you get as much technology information as you can, and you're probably going to need to go in a little more debt. Um, I, I guess I would try to, to probably the most important thing, find a mentor dentist, such as yourself, or um, somebody to really kind of teach you, uh, get under their wings, and, uh, you know, see some courses from Gordon Christensen, Frank Spear, some Howard Fran. And uh, really get some knowledge into what, what it is. That so you like on. GC, Gordon Christian. Absolutely. Frank Spear. Yeah. Uh, who else? Well, those are probably my two favorites that I've seen the most of. I spent a lot of time with Gordon Christensen over the years. Um, I haven't seen as much John Coyce as, as I have Frank Spear. It's funny because I'm so old. When I got out of school, Frank Spear and John Coyce were partners. They're partners. And the two greatest endodontists was uh, Cliff Ruddle Ruddle. and Steve Buchanan, and they were partners. And let me remind you that those are guys are all divorced too. Frank Spear and John Coyce, um, uh, Ruddle and uh, Buchanan. uh, Was John West part of that? John West. Part of... uh, Part of, was he in with those guys too? With which guys? With Buchanan and... uh, Oh, I don't know. John West? I don't don't know. Um, It seems like everybody's out of Seattle. But, you know, I, I don't think, I think all of those, I, I, I think he just said something very, very profound. It seems like most of the questions that we see on Dental Town is, well, you know, I got two job offers. Which one should I take? And, and the question's always something stupid like, well, this one's going to pay me 30%, but I pay my lab bill. And the other one's paying me 25%, and I pay half my lab bill. That's noise. Do you know how priceless it is to go work for a mentor? Who can teach you, and, and I, I think the most important um, mentorship would be the older dentist who can get along with the staff and the patients. Um, I, I'd, I'd rather learn that than how to pack cord and how to you know adjust occlusion. I mean, to go in with a technical dentist who's neurotic and psychotic and has staff turnover and lawsuits and five wives, that ain't, you don't want to learn that. I, I would want to go in and find an office and say, wow, Charlie has kept his receptionist, Amy, for 25 years, and the two new hygienists, one's been there 10 years, one's been there 13 years. That's the hardest skill to learn on earth, getting along with other humans. Managing people. Yeah. So so I I think the the deal, they should look for mentorship. Sure. Sure, I've had my, uh, my hygienist, Karen, for almost 20 years, and my office manager, Tiffany, for over 10 years. I've had Jan for 30, and, and I keep saying every year that one day I'm going to unchain her and uh, let her out the back door, but uh, I just haven't got to that point yet. Um, so, so talk about your implant journey. Um, what, how, did, how did you get into that? Did you pick a system first? Did you pick a mentor first? Did you pick... I, did. I took some classes from Gordon Christensen, and uh, I settled a couple of years ago on Implant Direct. Those were also the implants that uh, my uh, partner Dave at the time was... Uh, Placing. We just had the founder of Implants Direct on a podcast just a couple before you. Have we released that one yet? Uh, Gerald Nisnik. I think I think we did. But did you ever meet Nisnik? I haven't met him. Sorry. I think that was the third implant some company he uh, designed. Yes. I mean, yeah. one of the most amazing freak geniuses. He is such a freak genius. After he did his third implant system, he kind of got bored. You know what? You know what he's do, does now. He's making parts for aeronautical aircraft companies. Uh, I mean, it was yeah, just yeah. it was just a bigger job. I, I think he I think he seriously mastered the implant thing, yeah, right. and there was no Most creative. That's, that's there was no creative juices left. So okay, so let me get this right. You pick the implant system first. You mm-hmm. pick implants direct. Correct. And why did you pick implants direct? Well, it's one that, that Gordon had talked about. One that we already had in the office that my partner was doing, and put in, he did more of our surgical stuff. So I was already familiar with restoring them and uh, had seen them in action for five or six years and knew they worked. So I took a course from Implant Direct um, and started placing them. And then I just took uh, the course that Tim Kaczynski helps teach um, back in Detroit. And uh, they didn't use Implant Direct, they used to, so they talked about... He was one of the first teachers of implantology in the United States of America. Yeah, he was very good. 
I think his first company that he worked for is Brandmark. Okay. The, did you know that? No. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he was driving around with Brandmark back when. Yeah, he's placed eleven thousand implants or something. Like that. Yeah, he he was teaching Brandmark with Brandmark when ninety percent of your oral surgeons didn't know what an implant was. Really? I kid you not. Yeah, and he's not he's not that old. Yeah. <laughs> so he's been doing it a long time. Yeah. Um, so when you did implant training, was it all didactic lecture? Did you do any hands-on? In Tim's course, we did. Over the shoulder? Yep. Yeah. Over the shoulder, right in his office. He has some patients that, uh, um, you know, that will better his patients and get a discount for that. And he's right there over your shoulder. Now, Implants Direct, I think his original idea was a, 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 a mail order implant. Because in any business, the Fortune 500, um, when you buy something for a dollar, usually 53 cents goes to payroll. Right. And so by order, selling online, he could have a lower cost implant. The only secret to lower price, lower cost, get rid of the sales rep force. But it seems like over the years, they kind of scratch that strategy because they definitely have a sales force. Well, they do. A hands-on sales force. So it kind of, it kind of was, it's kind of like some, some things are easy to sell on Amazon, but some things need a little demonstration. So do you, did you think your local implants direct rep has been a big positive, helped you a lot or has it not really been a non-issue? So, um, it's, it's been helpful. I think the courses were by far the most helpful and, uh, just the, you know, doing the. And what's the website for his course? Do you, do you know what it is? No, I don't. I'll have to. Uh, I'll Google it. What's uh, how do you spell his name? Because K O S I N S. Is this another Polish name? Yes, it is. K O S. Yep. No, wait, wait. K. -S -S. Timothy, there he is. There he is. His website is smilecreator.net. Smilecreator mm -hmm. Now you and him both have dot nets. What's up? You don't see that very often. Most they people are dot. They didn't have a dot com available. Oh my! Yes. They didn't have what? For my ZDDS, they didn't have a dot com available. So ZDDS is your website? Yes. And someone had taken the dot com? Yes. So you took the dot net? I took the dot net. And has that been a factor or is that? I, I don't know. That's you don't know? Huh. I always think it's funny because you're giving away your age if you have a dot net or an email that's AOL. Well, that's my... do, you have, what, do you have an AOL email address? I do not have an AOL address. <laughs> I have a Gmail address. <laughs> But since my practice, the sole practice, is only three and a half years old, I got a new website at that point. And so the, the dot net is what I was left with. Some, some manufacturer of dental equipment or something, or dental products, as ZVDS.com. Well, that's funny because my name is Ferran. So Ferran is all is Irish, so it's all uh, there. It's, it's there's actually Fran Engineering, Fran Company, you know all this. Fran was all taken. By the way, Zach, um, this is the day before St. Patrick's Day. Yes, Tomorrow is St. Patrick's Day, and right. you know that Dental Town went live on St. Patrick's Day in 1999. 99? And this is 27. So tomorrow, Dental Town turns 18 years old. Hey, happy birthday! God, isn't that crazy? What are you gonna do for your birthday? Oh my gosh. I don't work. know. Yeah, work. <laughs> Probably I would see patients all day. Um, but yeah, um, that, that is a... Uh, so so back back to Tim, though. So um, did you go to his course just because he was Polish and you Polish guys are... Uh, sure. You guys stick together? Absolutely. So tell me about his course. Is it Was it one day? Was it one weekend? No, was it, it was three? Two days, two days didactic, and then you place implants on the third day. And how much was that course? About 5000 U.S. or a lot? U.S. <laughs> I forgot I don't know what the um so so it was how much for three days? Five thousand. Five thousand dollars. I believe. Sorry Tim if I'm wrong. So five thousand dollars. And um so you watched two days of lecture and then you watched him over the shoulder. Yep. He and uh, Yeah, well th this guy was on the uh the very beginning of implants. Yeah. I I couldn't think of a, a greater guy. And the uh, the other thing that I like about this is um you gotta think about the geniusness so there's so many Subtle geniuses of what he's saying is um, when he learned a hands-on, how far is Tim from your office? Two miles. Two miles. And that's what I, that's what um, scares me. Like a, a dentist will fly across the country and learn some technique, then go all the way back to Alabama and then get in trouble and he's in over his head. And I still think, looking back at my 30 years, the best continued education I ever got was just going into the specialist office across the street sure. and saying, I have a two hour opening 
what are you doing? And, and I'm about to, blow, you know, and, yeah. and, and then um, you build a relationship with them because, you know, when I started in 87, you know, I'm, I'll just tell you the ugly truth. I mean, like when I got into wisdom teeth, I mean, the first year, a dozen times I pulled out the top half of the wisdom tooth. And then an oral surgeon pulled out the lower half. You know, we we like to break it up that way. Sure. You know, it's just more convenient yeah. for the patient for me to pull out the top half than you have to go across the street for the lower half. You got the bigger half. But but if you learn how to pull wisdom teeth three thousand miles away from home, what 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 is that instructor there? And um, I I just think that um, I just don't understand why people would drive three thousand miles to learn endo. When you have an endodontist who's over there sure. sending you cookies on Valentine's Day and muffins on Christmas and yeah. tr- doing anything he can to have a relationship. Yeah, I went to my endodontist's office about three months ago and spent the day. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. And I also think orthodontists should be the ones teaching all the ortho and Invisalign because the one thing the general dentist doesn't understand in that class is that he's like, oh, I can do that. Yeah, yeah but do you realize in an orthodontist's office he sees six of those people in an hour? He's flipping those bays every 10 minutes, and then you say you can do that, and then you're at a half hour? So if he's doing that in 10 minutes, and you're doing that in 30, do you have one-third the overhead he does? I mean, usually the orthodontist has 50% overhead, and the general dentist has 65. And now you're doing ortho three times longer? Does any of this add up? I took took some ortho training from somebody that you know very well, Rick Litt. Oh, the best. Yeah, he's just wonderful. He's absolutely the best. And the reason I say he's the best is because of this. Orthodontics seems easy when you're talking about the mechanics of glue and rubber bands and all that kind of stuff. But where ortho goes incredibly wrong, incredibly fast, is a diagnosis. you got to get an A on the diagnosis and treatment plan. And I cringe at people learning ortho in, in, a, in a weekend short-term ortho class. And the Richard Litt is the, and, and Richard Litt and right up here, up the street from me, Harry Green, okay. are the only two board certified orthodontists in America that will teach a low life general dentist. Yeah, right. okay. Not all the other ones will never do it. Yeah. All the endodontists will, periodontists, if you, if you call up your endodontist, say, will you lecture at our study club? Hell yeah. Sure. He'll bring three racks of slides. Right. You call the orthodontist? No, no. If you you know, send it to me. You don't need to know anything. And, and um, Harry Green uh, teaches an ortho course called Tip Edge. And Richard Lett used to be the director of the orthodontic program at uh, UAP, or was it UCSF? And then he went to the University of Detroit. And, um, and he's uh, just an amazing, and so many people in that lecture. I can remember going to that, and it was, I don't know, it was four. No, uh, he he came down here. Oh, he did. Yeah, he told me he asked me to go to. It was way back in the day, and it was so um, the lecturing schedule, my lecturing schedule, and finally one day he just said, "Damn it, Howard! You know, when, when are you going to do this?" And I'm looking at my schedule. I said, "You know, I could only do it if it was in Phoenix on these four weekends." So he built the course because I marketed to all my homies in okay. the backyard. So I filled up his course. With my friends from back here, nice. and um, course, yeah, it, it, it's it's great, but you really should be taught by someone who who spent a living teaching orthodontist. Yeah. You know, yeah. and if you and if the and if the general dentist was learning that from their board certified orthodontist in their own hometown, not only would they learn ortho better, but they'd be in the office saying, "Oh my God, this is an entirely different beast." Yeah. You got to flip these chairs at max every 15 minutes. So when you're used to schedule, and the other thing about ortho is this, you know, an orthodontic case, let's say it's six grand. How much is two implants and two crowns? Six grand. Yeah. And how long is the implant case and how long is the ortho case? You know, so six grand looks like a lot of money, but you start spreading that over all these, all these visits. And I've read a lot of dentists. And some of the smartest dentists that I've ever known realized after they got really big into ortho that they were losing money on every case. And, and they said, you know, I'd rather do, you know, ended on us, oral surgeons they haven't made. I mean, they just sit down, do a thousand bucks, they're done, move, move the on, stone. you know, move. And uh, so when you start having these multiple appointments over a year, year and a half, and look what the orthodontists are doing. The orthodontists have found out that... They're not, but what they're really all massively getting into is accelerated ortho. 
So you start looking at these vibration techniques, yeah. these, um, what were those, uh, what's the drilling in? Uh, the micro. The micro perforations. Very good, Zach. Um, nice. Is your dad a dentist? Uh, the micro perforations, all this stuff, because they're sitting there thinking, okay, if I do a micro perforation <laughs> each visit, on Invisalign, instead of doing a tray every four weeks, if I did a tray every two weeks, if I did vibrations, perforations, if I did all these things, I mean, their goal is now there's a lot of really hot orthodontists that are knocking out all their cases in 12 months. Yeah, right. So take the overhead of two years, yeah. crunch it down to a year, and then and then what does an average orthodontist say? Well, how much is that micro perforation kit? How much is the vibrator? Well, how much is another year's worth of appointments? You know? I wonder how well that works. Uh, well, it, the, the, um, the, the ones um, we, I've talked to, um, we, we got a whole slew of work on. Twice as fast. Yeah, cut twice as fast. Okay. Yeah, and then they've changed the materials of the tray, yeah. you know, so, that, you know, the materials in the tray. But, but the holy grail of uh, ortho now is f faster. You know, let's get this down to under a year. And we got a whole slew of... Uh, taped uh, podcast coming out on ortho where it's uh it's really getting a lot faster and the other holy grail is um where there's big money going after it is you know the amalgams i i, I know dentists you know they don't like to hear anything they don't want to believe but the amalgams were lasting 38 years because everything in there was antibacterial it was mercury silver zinc copper tin i mean stannous fluoride that's tin, silver. Now the pediatric dentist using silver diamide. I mean, I mean, everything in an amalgam, silver nitrate. silver nitrate. Everything in an amalgam is not found in a multivitamin, <laughs> and um, and then we replace it with these pretty fluffy white plastic inert fillings that are lasting six and a half years, according to the insurance data, crunching hundreds of millions of claims. And then you go meet all the dentists in the world, and they'll say, "Well, my." My composites last longer than amalgam. I know that because that's what you want to believe. But you might want to believe in the tooth fairy in the Easter Bunny, but there's no data to prove that it exists. But those those composite um, manufacturers, if you talk to like Bob Ganley, the CEO of uh, Ivoclare, everybody is looking for antimicrobial ingredients in composites. That'll be the next big thing. And then the other thing is they want a reversible cement. They want to be able to cement a crown and then do something to it. Ultrasonic, heat it up, do something and have it come back, off. Have it come back off. So there's a lot of big money chasing those things. Yeah. But so I want to tell you this though, but, but you went into implants and how, how many have you placed in two years? Just about 10 or 12. 10 or 12. Before you got implants, did you like any blood and guts? Did you pull teeth? Did you mm -hmm. pull wisdom teeth? I, or did you, you know, like... I didn't do as many... Um partnership because my partner did i did more endo and some other things but he did a lot of surgery it didn't bother me but uh when we started a long time ago we kind of split split the you know split in the road there and he took the surgery aspect of that so um when i got my practice on my own i figured i better learn how to do this stuff and try to do it learn how to do it fast that's when i took tommy's course and, you know, going on, you know, mission trips is a great way to get So talk about Tommy's course. So he combines missionary dentistry with exodontia. Yep. Yep. So talk about it's that. It's great. It's a, it's a fantastic course. He does it with... Um, What's his website? I think it's We Teach, we teach Extractions, I think. Let me see. Is it really? Yeah. Yeah, WeTeachExtractions.com. Yep. Tom Murphy. With Gail Fletcher. Love you, Tom Murphy. <laughs> and oh, wait, I'll do it with my uh, Anne Marie Gorsicek. Um, Gorsica, is that uh, is that Polish enough for you? Sure. I right. knew you were coming. So uh, my my favorite orthodontist is Anne Marie Gorsica, um, outside of uh, Northern Cal, kind of by San Fran. Okay. And uh, she's just an, an an adorable person. So you so talk talk about weteachextractions dot com yeah, and the infamous Tom Murphy. And Tom Murphy. He, uh, I, I looked that up and somehow found out about that, and it was within the first month that I had my practice on my own, I was off to Guatemala because I thought, boy, I better learn how to do some extractions or I can't be referring, uh, you know, referring a lot of extractions out. So you, you fly down there, we had 12 dentists, I believe. And um, he and Fletch teach the course for two, one long day and then one short day. So you're basically two full days of didactic, going over all kinds of things, 
flap design and uh, and this and that and, and then we drove about two and a half hours to another town and where the Lions Club had set up. They had a, an area for us to set up and those guys do these courses about four times a year so they have all the equipment and they keep it in, in the storage thing at the, uh, in the storage bin. At the they do four courses a year in Guatemala? I, think, I believe it's four. By the way, Zach, do you... Uh, Zach is my youngest four boys, uh, 21, 23, 25, 27. Do you know how old you were when you did your first dentistry on a missionary dentistry trip? Oh, yeah, I was like <coughs> 16. That's the first you remember? I think so, yeah. 15, 16. And what, what well, I don't want to say for legal reasons, but I thought it was just amazing. Uh, I, I just thought it was so romantic taking your boys and doing fillings and extractions on, on missionary dentistry. Just, just loved it. Super. So do you like Guatemala? Yeah, I love Guatemala. So yeah, what's the capital of Guatemala? Um, Guatemala City. Guatemala City. Yeah. So you flew into Guatemala City? We flew into Guatemala City, and that's where we did the uh, didactic portion. And then we drove to a town called Xela, X-E-L-A, about two and a half hours away. And second biggest city, I believe, in Guatemala. And uh, again, they have, they have jerry-rigged, really jerry-rigged suction units that I think Gail Fletcher made out of... Uh, um, shop vacs <laughs> that we use to just use basic, you know, backyard lawn chairs for for the chairs and that with little um, with little foam foamies from the kids swimming as a headrest and kind yeah, we took out uh, we had four days and we took out nine hundred and some teeth I think. And that is another. But, but they're right over your shoulder, you know. Yeah, and that's you, another. Right over your shoulder, helping you. That's another big pet peeve I have on um, Dental Town, where you have all these dentists from a few very rich countries like the U.S., Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom, bad mouthing amalgam. And so then I'm in these. You know, I, I lectured me, me and Zach were in. What? How many continents were we in last year? Five. And um, and you go into these third world countries, and a dentist says, "I don't use amalgam," and he's sitting with a patient in a chair with a pickle bucket. And he acid etches the tooth, and then she swishes with a Dixie cup and spits in a bucket. Then he paints on the resin and then cures it. Then she rinses again while he adds, and it's like, you can't, you can only do this under pristine, isolated conditions. And there's 2 million dentists on earth, and only 500,000 out of those 2 million practice like we do. And the other million and a half are like what you're talking about. And when that dentist hears us bad-mouthing amalgam, mm -hmm. and his dental school is nine months long, right. it, it, it's a travesty. Yeah. It's absolutely a travesty. And, 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 then, and then you have these liberals that want to ban amalgam uh -huh. because, you know, you know they're not going to have toothaches and teeth extracted they're, they're not going to go edentulous so it's really easy for them to ban everything that poor people need there's seven billion people and three billion live off three dollars a day and there's a dentist for all those people too and amalgam i mean i can imagine um anything anybody does in a rich country to tarnish water fluoridation or dental amalgam uh for the poorest parts of asia africa and latin america are, are just evil yeah, but uh, so so what else? What else you want to talk about? Well, just you know, I, I guess you know people are interested in, in learning about uh, you know mission dentistry or whatever. That's kind of been my. Uh, and how did you get passion. into mission dentistry? Back in dental school, we had an opportunity for they took twenty four different students for two weeks at a time up to Northern Michigan to work on migrant workers, children in between. And where where where, where did they migrate from? Mexico. Mexico. Yeah, up there for the cherry crop. Mm -hmm. Michigan has quite a cherry crop, so we stayed in Traverse City, and uh, it was it was a great experience. I mean, one of those things where you you, you learn so little in dental school, really, and then taking two weeks to go up there and really practice dentistry, really was eye opening and really helped, I think, get through senior year because you've really done an awful lot of dentistry in a two week period. So that kind of became a passion. Um, during that time, and you know, there's a lot of volunteer opportunities within the states that I, you know, I've done a number of those type of things. But getting getting abroad overseas has been has been a lot of fun. I just had lunch today with Charity Crawford over at the Open Wide Foundation, right? Who keeps saying she's going to get you on one of their one of their uh, 
trips down there to the Oak and White Foundation that Frank Spear found. <coughs> well, tell her that her and Frank should come over here and talk about it. I, well, you know what? Are you going back there tomorrow? Yeah. Well, t- I know, uh, tell her and Frank to come down here okay. and they can talk all about that to a very large audience. Okay. Yeah, and I and what what country are they in? Guatemala. Same, same Guatemala. So They're why Guatemala, why is um why you hear so much about going on in Guatemala and Costa Rica? What, what what's what's the deal about Guatemala? Why why is poor. that? It's just really poor. Um, and most of Central America is except except Costa Rica. Costa Rica has you know I guess some very very talented dentists from what I understand. Um, Guatemala is just a real real poor country, and they chose that with the Open Wide Foundation to be their model country. They want to branch out into other countries eventually, but this is where they set up the first of their open wide clinics. And I, I love the concept there because their idea is to run the clinic and help integrate it into the community. So they turn, they're turn turning these clinics over to the locals. So it's more of a, you know, teach a man to fish type of thing. Right. And, and I think it's just fantastic. That, that was another very profound deal. You know, back in the day, in the 80s, missionary dentistry was like a bunch of Star Wars troopers who come land, do all this unbelievable dentistry, then fly out and it's gone. And that model was a horrible model. And over the years, it was Jerome Smith. Some people, but you know, it's certainly... It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. It doesn't make a long-term it's difference. It's certainly sustainable. And it was Jerome Smith who said, you know what we need to do? You need to find a place. You do missionary dentistry. Go back to the same place every year. But when you go there, find the locals in the hood who are going to be there when you're gone. And then you make a connection with them. So you're giving, so now you're there, Tom Murphy. You're showing them what to do. And then what's cool is then three months later, he has your email address and he can text you on his WhatsApp and say, man, it'd be cool if I had 10 boxes of of this. And then nine times out of 10, you can go to Shine or Patterson or Dill and say, do you have any expired this? (coughs) So it's more of a, a sustainable Bismarck. And I always loved my favorite girl growing up, um, besides my mom, was uh, Mother Teresa Calcutta, who always said, you know, if you can't feed 100, feed one. And if you can't, ha- if you can't go to 220 countries, just go to Guatemala. Sure. Um, I like well, the one we were going to where um, Zach and I and the boys, we go to, um, you know, fly into Acapulco. So you got a five-star restaurant. Nice. So you have your nice food and drink. Okay. And then you get up in the morning, just commute an hour out into the bush crank all day long uh, but then you come home to nice you know hotel. nice hotel so you know this this open white foundation they stay in antigua which is nice i know some people were thinking about doing international mission trips maybe worried or nervous about the conditions or whatever and i was you know talking with charity today and i said you, you know if someone's interested in that you're the perfect place to take a step in because you've got this beautiful clinic they have a sarek down with their clinics down there and you do the work there in, a, in an air-conditioned clinic, and then you get back to uh, Antigua at night, which is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful, beautiful city. So uh, you're doing an awful lot of dental work, but uh, it's it's not quite as harsh an environment as, as some places you can go. What are you doing? Um, I, that just reminds me, Zach, you know what I want to do for my April Fool's joke this year? What's that? Is I want to... Um, I'm trying to remember it because I'm at my age. I'll forget April Fool's joke, Sarac bike. Um, hey, honey, I'm in a podcast. I'll be done in just uh, 30 minutes, okay? Oh, I just want to show you something. <laughs> and um, I want to get the. Uh, I want to get the. Um, Are you still taping? Yeah, you, you can edit that out, though, right? Yeah, I'll just edit. I want to find the name of the April guy. Fool's oh, joke. Oh, uh, no, you want to what? No, um, Tim April Fool's. I'm trying to get this, uh, there, there it is. April Fool's joke. Um, God dang it. I'm hitting the wrong button. Chris Bailey. You know, you know what my April Fool's joke's going to be? You just remind me what it was. Thanks for doing that. You just stimulated me. You know what it's going to be? What's that? Um, Zach, we'll go get the Serac machine, and then we'll go, um, we'll put it outside underneath the palm tree, so the background, so people will think that um, it's, um, somewhere exotic. that it's somewhere exotic, and I am doing the bicycle to generate the electricity 
uh, to run uh, the Cirac machine. And uh, so here's Howard out in the jungles of Guatemala um, pedaling on his bicycle to make the electricity, to make Cirac machines, um, 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 you blah, blah, blah. So can you edit all that out, Zach? Okay. Um, the guy that runs the course with Tim Kaczynski, <coughs> his name is Todd Engel. Oh, Todd Engel. Yes, he does the course. He's the director of the course. Yeah, we podcast right. him so too. I wonder if you podcast yeah. him. Yeah. His name escaped me because I know Tim quite well, but... Uh, so it would be, I forget what the name of but they were just on the cover of the AGD magazine for, you know, teaching implants and having a live component there, which is so, so much more valuable than any didactic one. But that was the guy's name that's been grabbed and wrecked my brain. I'm trying to think of it, Todd Engel, and he's really good. So one of the, one of the um, things I like to ask, um, the thing I love the most about dentists is, um, you go anywhere in the world, the dentists are always in the top 1% education. They're usually in the top 5% income. Um, you spend the night at a hundred dentist houses. They always have a hundred nonfiction books. Whenever you go spend the night at someone's house who's um, not a dentist, a physician, or a lawyer, um, it's like, you know, People Magazine, Time Magazine, or it's all works of fiction and all that kind of stuff. Dentists are just intellectual people. Yeah. I love dentists. So I always ask the missionary dentist, like, what do you think is it is? What do you think makes a country poor? I mean, you got places like Japan that are on a volcanic island with nothing going on in their favor. I mean, three faults hitting, no natural resource, no oil and gas, and they have the richest economy in the world. And then you go to some place like Guatemala where just anything grows, ocean, fish, just, just everything you could ask for. And um, and they're, it's poor. What, what what do you think is behind uh, that poverty? Um, leadership. I think in a lot of ways, if you get corrupt leadership, um, I think that can steal away from you know help, really helping the people. And you know if they didn't set up good infrastructure, and things like that. And uh, um, but I think you know you look back in a lot of these poor countries and just the leadership of the government was really, really a problem in the past. You know, uh, tyrants or, um, you know, they just don't support, you know, learning and they don't want the people necessarily to advance. You know, so you think leadership and corruption is a big part of the poor? And, um, education, you know, certainly. The education system. I, I think the education is a big system because if you look at the British Empire, Every country they touched, sure, they did a lot of horrible things, like life was very horrible back then in most circumstances, but they always dropped an education system. Yeah. And so all there where the British Empire was, United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, any country they touched, and it's so measurably more successful than the number two colonizer, France, or the number three, Portugal, and England... It, the British left a better school system. So you know that um, the education system is just sure. crucial. Absolutely. Crucial. If, you, if you're not taking those puppies at six years sure. old and starting with the reading and the writing and the arithmetic, right. it Guatemala, really... Guatemala, you know, a lot of the people that we treated, they were, they were supposed to sign some type of a release form. And a lot of them had to just put a phone around there because they couldn't read. Yeah. And what I loved about it the most is I've taken a... Zach, how many countries do you think you've been to in your life? I think 13. 13? Yeah. And um, I, I think, I, I think the, um, so many times when you hear Americans talk about politics, they're not, even in, they're not even 60 seconds into their illiterate rant and you realize you've never even left Kansas. Right, right. If you would have, if you would have just gone to... Three other countries and three other continents, you would know everything you said was baloney. Yeah, so, yeah. And then I want to say one last thing, but it would be taken as incredibly racist and toxic and all that stuff, but it's just what you see. Um, I call it the culture aspect. You go to some countries, and when you're sitting around the dinner table, uh, I don't care if they're Lebanese, they're Persian, Korean, Japanese, they're just always top business and then when you go to poor countries 
no one ever talks business. Right. It's soccer and sports and food and music, all the greatest aspects of life. Uh -huh. But do you think you can sit down with a Persian family for a three hour dinner and business not come up? Right. Or Lebanese yeah. or Scotland, I mean, or Japan or Korean? Lebanese, Germany. Yeah, those yeah. countries, they can't go 15 minutes without talking business, overhead, profit, sales, marketing, this, that. And then you can go do a five city tour in some of these four countries and never once even hear the subject. And I, I think that um, you're right, leadership, education, but if no one's interested in business at the end of the day, you're going to be a third world country. That's true. But there, there are some cultures that, I mean, they're just, that's, that's all they talk about is business. Yeah. And, and they love it. And I've always loved business. I've always loved, yeah. even though I'm a dentist, I've always loved business. I've loved economics. I, I, I loved it. So what's that? Better as a dentist. Yeah. So if you don't, so if your country doesn't have a culture of talking business, then it's really going to have some huge ramifications at the end. So um, what would you, um, what would you tell someone? Most of the dentists I say, I hear say, you know, I've always wanted to do a mission ship. I've always wanted to do a charitable dentist, but they don't know what, where, on Dental Town, we have 50 forms, root canals, filling rounds. One's called humanitarian dentistry, and we break that up into two, charitable dentistry and mission dentistry, just because some people um, like to uh, you know, do missionary work, which has a religious aspect to it. Some just like to do charitable work. But if someone's listening and saying, what, what, what would you recommend? I, that, well, it's, there's, it's, there's it's on their bucket list. If you want to, the ADA has a great list. You know, of different charitable uh, um, mission trips, whether they're secular or non-secular. I've, I've only done the non-religious, but they're, you know, you can check with your, your church. But the ADA has a great website of tons and tons of lists, and you, you can break it down by whether it's secular or non-secular. You can break it down by country, by whether it's teaching or delivery of care. Um, I would think that that's, that's a great place. I learned an awful lot, basically, from your magazine do good issue that you've had out for how many years now i don't know but i've gone since 1994 years. that was the first 94 so if you i was only 12 years old experiences you know and, and you have them archived so well on the website there you can go back to any of the may issues is generally when the do good issue is in there and it talks about a number of different programs and some of the ones that i've done are talked about on there and in fact i learned about the one i'm going to do in may with john leland down in uh, el salvador from your last do good issue so that's a great place to learn about uh different mission trips but the, the, that and the ada site are just for me it was a real spiritual thing because you go down there with five or six dentists and i remember getting on the airplane on my first one and i was almost like having heart palpitations because I had all this going on. I was yeah. married, I had four kids, Chiapas, Mexico. Okay. And I had married, four kids, business, all this stuff. You're just crazy. And I thought I was under all this stress. Uh -huh. and then I fly to Dallas, meet up with five other dentists, and we fly to Mexico City. Then we drive, fly to Chiapas, and we drive up in this village and get out, and there's 5,000 people with no running water, electricity, and you're just like, wow, uh -huh. what a reset boot. Sure. Right, right. It's like, what yeah, were all my problems right. again? Right. And I remember the first time I took my four boys. Do you remember what you said to me? Or it might have been one of your brothers that said to me that made me laugh so hard I almost choked up crying. We, I took them to a charity deal. We drove uh, three hours. We're three hours from the border in Phoenix, you know, okay. just to go down to Mexico. We went to a charity mission trip. I take my four boys. And it was so fun. You get to see your dentist. And my boys are looking around. And, and, they, and one of them, I think it was Eric, said, Dad, how come they don't have trampolines? Trampolines. <laughs> And so here you are with no running water, no electricity, or no sewage. The only thing my six-year-old boy notices is there's no trampolines. Okay. And, then, uh, and then I think it was Greg who said, and, and how come they don't have swimming pools? And I said, because some people don't have trampolines and swimming pools. Or electricity or running water. Yeah, and, but, but for me, it was always, um, you know, when we were little, in Catholic school, we always had to do a yearly retreat. You're Polish, so you must be Catholic. Yeah, and so you had to do the the yearly retreat thing, and you would just go kicking and screaming, kicking and screaming, didn't want to go. But but unplugging from Friday after school till Sunday night when they brought you back to church, where you couldn't go do your, your routine habits, and you had to unplug. I, half the time, I wouldn't, didn't even listen to what they were saying. I was just spacing out in a chair thinking about, you know, almost like meditation. 
But but that's what I love about unplugging. Um, that's why I like nice. um, charity of dentistry because you don't have cell phone service. You lose your internet connection. <laughs> you you lose all your routine, and then you're sitting out there in the bush thinking life's kind of beautiful. And there's something majestic about simple. Few days or a week, you know, it was in Honduras, and there's there's no such thing as a internet connection way up in the mountains where we're at. So you know, kind of get back, and it's nice not to have the news on for a week to really. And what's out. also funny is I'm from uh, Phoenix, which is a uh, Utah South, so. Uh, at least ten percent of the dentists in Phoenix are Mormon, okay. and they all have half their families in Utah. And it's so funny because no matter how far back you get in the bush, no matter where you're at in the world, you'll still see two Mormon missionaries come by. And uh, and I love talking to them. Remember how many times have we seen more missions? Everywhere. Every every trip we've gone to. Yeah. And we'll stop them and yeah, say, right. well, they, they, they crash course the language. Uh -huh. they, they're there for a year. And I, they're so intellectual because they're young, so they're bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. They don't, you know, and then you just say, well, what's up with this country? And then it goes back to the same deal. Yeah. Well, the president is a crook. Right. The schools are horrible. Don't you find it a good way, though, for people to, to get a chance to see the world if they oh, yeah. a dentist? What a better way to, to see the world. And, uh, you know, I've tried to pick a different place every year. So, so how many countries have you been to? I have seven. And what are they? Um, let's see, I've been to Mexico a couple of times, Honduras a couple of times, Guatemala. Um, I went to Bolivia. I went to uh, the U.S. as well. <laughs> so you you love the you love the Latina. You love the Central and South America. Well, also, I went to Vietnam last year with Project Vietnam, and one of my favorite ones. I went was to that Houston. with Danny um, Barbara or not Donnie Barbaro's climb um, climb for a cause? D no, Danny no, Barbaro. No, uh, he's uh, out of Chicago. He has he has a Vietnam mission, but this Project is a, Vietnam. Project Vietnam. Yes. There, there with a whole big, we had a crew of 60, lots of physicians and all that stuff. So that was that was good. But then there's a um, Dental Volunteers for Israel is another one that I did, which is if somebody wants to go see Jerusalem and Israel, what a great way to do that. They give you an apartment for a whole week for free. And that's, uh, <coughs> it's, a, it's not a cheap city to be in. I know, I have to, uh, that's bucket list. We got to take grandma back to that. I, I sent my uh, mom. Israel on a, on a ladies trip or whatever and oh my god she loved that more than anything in the world and not in Israel and I told him I um but um I um I got it and my two oldest sisters are nuns I mean I mean, I've been a dentist 30 years Mary Kay's been sister Anna Yahweh for 35 years and she just needs to see that I mean she spent her whole life thinking about it but yeah Israel yeah so, so what, what kind of what kind of um, volunteer clinics are there in uh, Israel? This one, this one was nice. It, was it in Jerusalem? Tel Aviv? It was in Jerusalem. Right, right in Jerusalem. Which part of the city? Uh, south of it was south of the main uh, old you know the old city. Yeah. I don't remember the exact name of the, of the area, but it was you know. Very if you area. you're you're big on email, if you get that ADA web link, send it to me, and yeah, we'll. It's on here. And we'll put them, uh, um, okay. Yeah, all the, all the different yeah. webs, you know, the different places. And that would be I good because I could uh, take my mom to Israel and I could do volunteer dentistry so I don't have to, because my mom, all, she, all she'll do is run. Yeah. So that's yeah. good. I said to mom, <laughs> I said to mom, I, uh, she went to go to um, Ireland next. And I said, what do you want to do in Ireland? She goes, I want to see every church in Ireland. It's like, oh God, I hope my brother takes you <laughs> and not me. I really... Really don't want to see every church in Ireland. That's a little too much, even for an Irish boy. That's a lot of churches. Yeah. Um, so we, I only got you for five minutes left. Um, do you do you think we both agree seeing the world is good? We both agree that missionary dentists, you know, a lot of dentists think they're all stressed out and, you know, they're, they're all crazy. And then getting out to the third world um, is a really nice reset button. But since I'm... Irish, a culture of business. We like to mix business and pleasure. I like to take family vacations where I lecture and then we spend a week there. Yeah. Um, Tom Murphy, you can go there, pull a bunch of teeth, learn learn business of pulling teeth, and then you know do other stuff. Do you like um, do you like just straight missionary dentistry, or do you ever oh, no, like no, mixing no, no, the no, business always, and pleasure? Always got to mix some cultural. Go. I mean, I always have a camera around my neck when I'm on trips. So yeah, talk about your book. 
All those are just photos I've done over the years. So Z just, images. Just threw, I just threw a bunch of them in the uh, in a book and left it. I used to give this away to patients if uh, they if they refer a new patient or something to the office. I'll throw them a book because they're familiar with my photos because they're usually on the wall. You got to sign my yes, book. I will. I will. I'll do that before I leave. Excellent. Um, this is this is a guy from Poland, right there, right in right in downtown Warsaw. So there's that's funny. You you your 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 picture of uh, your cover being Polish, a Polish guy um, doing the a musical instrument, and my favorite uh, museum in Warsaw was what, what's his name Chop Chop Chopin Chop, Chopin, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and what was the most interesting about that museum of Chopin? The Polish are extremely musical. But the reason he had two things, he not only was a genius player, but he had a, a finger stretch that just because you're the greatest pianist in the world, you might not have the reach to play it's Chopin. Like like yeah. yeah. And, um, so, um, yeah, Chopin was an interesting character, but he was also kind of a geometry freak in, in that reach. And, and I know a couple of, um, pianists that are professional mm -hmm. piano players and they say that they can't play Chopin. One is a little five foot one Hispanic girl. Okay. And she goes, look at me, I'm, I'm just little. I, and you, know, you, you need to be big. Even though Chopin was a little person, yeah. he, he had a very big reach. Yes. So you enjoy Poland? Uh, I, I think it's one of the greatest cities in the world. I, I got to tell you the funny Polish story. So the first time I lectured there, um, the, I get there and this lady's just completely stressing out, checking me in and, and there seems to be a problem. I don't speak Polish, whatever. But anyway, my reservation got lost or whatever the hell, whatever. And I'm, I'm like, well, do you not have a room? She goes, yeah, we do have a room. But she goes, but it, it's not in the good part. And I'm like, I, I don't care. And she goes, this is all new. And then, so they're walking back there and, and long story short, this hotel is like 500 years old. And about every hundred years, they added a deal and it was all sold out. And they're apologizing, walking me back to the very beginning of this, the, what they think is the most horrible room in the hotel. And I'm from Phoenix, Arizona, where yeah. there's nothing over 50 years old. Right. And I thought it was the coolest damn thing in the world to be in a room that was 500 years old. And I just remember laying in the bed, looking at these massive cracks in the ceiling, because I think in a, in a half a millennium, how much that ground had settled. And I just thought, and all the renovations, of course, the plumbing had to be outside and out, you know, you can't retrofit anything. And, and I told them when I checked out, they were still apologizing. And I said, I would have paid triple to stay in that room. And that was the new room? No, that was the that was the, uh, the 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 cheap section was the 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 old stuff at the very beginning because they just kept adding on yeah. sections, right. and it's like who who in the world would want to go to Vietnam and stay in the Marriott? Right. Wouldn't you want to go to Vietnam and stay? I, I, I and, and um and the other thing I love the most is when I lecture they always say well we're going to put you up in this hotel and I say okay that's fine but my first preference is to stay at a dentist's house. I, I'd really much rather, yeah. I, I want to know how a dentist lives yeah. in Poland or Malaysia or Cambodia. I, I, I already know how a Hyatt works and that doesn't interest me. And, and, and it's very fun anthropologically because to see how a Polish man talks to his wife, how he talks to his children, what they eat, to open up their ice box uh -huh. and just see an ice box filled with like sausages and, <laughs> and, and, and potato and and i mean you know, all the just Kielbasa. yeah and that's to me that's the coolest part about seeing another country and and the and the dumbest part of going to another country be staying in the in a hilton yeah. or a marriott i mean why don't you just go to tucson sure you know I suppose not everybody has the ability to be able to to get into a dentist's home but boy if you have that opportunity or visit their office I find that fascinating when you've gone on mission trips to be able to visit one of the local dentist's offices and see what the what they have in their you know they're all always very proud of their office what they got and they want to show you and, and share what they're and it's still a very um it's still around the world about a third of the people seem to be in a profession that they were born into whether it be farming cattle yeah. um, milk. Um, but it seems like uh, dentistry is still that way. We just went, we got back from Cambodia and Malaysia. Almost every dentist we met, their dad or mom was a dentist, so their exactly. uncle or their. It, it seems to be about a third anywhere anywhere you go. Um, I mean, I've been in Brazil. I've eaten dinner at a Brazilian dentist house where there were thirty five dentists at the dinner table that were all related. Oh my! Thirty five. Oh. 
I mean, it was every other brother, sister, cousin, and uncle the was a dentist. So were you, um, were you, was anybody a dentist in your family? Uncle. See, see, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, so my godmother's, uh, husband was a dentist. So let's end on this note. That was an amazing hour. I had so much fun, but I always think, um, we owe it to the next generation. Uh, they're coming out of school. They're stressed. They're 25, $350,000 in debt. What advice would, if your daughter just walked out of dental school, $350,000 in debt, she was a newly minted Wolverine dentist from Michigan. There you go. What would you do? You know, I I think getting back to getting hooked up with with the right type of a mentor is probably the most important thing to teach you. uh, Someone who's been successful, that can teach you the business side of things. Um, It's, it's, you know, it's not easy. You've got a lot to learn and, you know, you you don't learn that much in dental school. You learn so much more when you get out. But try to try to have some fun along the way. Maybe learn to give back and feel a little better by yourself. Try to take a mission trip. They don't have to be expensive. And uh, get involved in giving back locally or something like that. Uh, but but find a, a good mentor, a good group. Get involved in the AGD. Go to some of the meetings. Because so you're going to find some really neat people in those local AGD chapters in my opinion and uh, when I first got out of school I was uh, you know a couple of the AGD dentists took me under their wing and just uh, helped to show me some things get some good teachers go see someone like Gordon Christensen he has a deal for students who are out five years or, or fewer for some of his courses find somebody that you really like that turns you on for uh, continuing education and just keep up the continuing education it doesn't have to be expensive go on to Deltown oh my gosh <laughs> doesn't have so to be expensive. Money. That's what not have to be expensive. that's what our mission is. We're we're giving them a daily show for free right. on their iPhone. How cool is that? It's fabulous, and, and it's only like fabulous. How, how much Deltown is helping dentists around the world? Because now the ubiquitous cell phone allows all these dentists all around the world to learn about dentistry, no matter where the heck they are. So you know, you always promote putting cases on there. Look at some cases on Deltown. And then eventually start putting some on. Well, we, we've been in a dozen dental schools in Asia and Africa, more than a dozen, okay. where all their textbooks are 20 years old right, or more, right. and oftentimes in the wrong language. Like they're donated from France. Okay. No one there speaks French. Uh, a lot of them are donated from um, um, Pakistan. Really? So they're in, what would their language be, Arabic? I think. And no one here yeah. is, speaks Arabic. And then they and then they get on Dental Town, and that case was posted yesterday, and that's um, that's amazing. And another thing I want to say about um, there's a lot of burnout, disease, depression in dentistry. I think 14 percent of dentists will be checked into inpatient uh, for substance abuse in their career. Probably 85 percent of the time that's alcohol, 15 percent of the time it's opioids, and their vacations are, are are not rejuvenating. They they go to Maui, and they come back with twenty thousand on their credit card. That's not a vacation. That's more. Sh- I mean, it, it, to me, it's just so crazy. And this dentist is about too big a house, too big a car, too big a lifestyle, stay home wife. And she's like, oh, honey, you're so stressed. I booked us a nice getaway to Maui. First class tickets. We're going to Maui. And we're gonna-. But compare that to going to Guatemala, yes. learning how to pull teeth with some real dentists like Tom Murphy, right. living in a hut. Really like rechecking your balance of life, yes. and it's such the disease of capitalism that to reward yourself, you buy more cars and jewelry and vacations to Maui and cruises, and that's part of the disease. Yeah, this could be an inexpensive way to go. You don't have to spend a fortune and go see something cool, do something fun, come back and feel a little better about dentistry. Yeah. Well, um, the only reason this show is so amazing is because I'm able to get guests like you on, and I want to thank you so much. And this shows you. So after a whole day of education, staying in Scottsdale, all normal people would want to go back to the Marriott, go to the nice dinner, have some drinks, hit up the town, and you, my friend, want to come over and see a short, fat, bald guy and talk dentistry for an hour. That speaks volumes of you. Well, I I Great called you. House and, uh, you know, you took me to lunch the last time I was here, and I certainly remembered that and wanted to get a touch of you and try to offer the same back to you. 
Man. Said he invited me out here. And 